Now, the rest of the story. Patrick leaned palms forward against the passenger ship's rail. He was watching the moon rise over the ocean horizon like a silent silver ghost in the midnight sky. Lonely feeling, partly because of the dark and the quiet, partly because Patrick must not be accompanied on the adventure on which he was about to embark. It had to be that way. A solitary comrade on this mission might arouse suspicion, and if anyone suspected what Patrick was up to, well, there was no telling what might happen. And the national security of his homeland, Great Britain, doubtless depended on his success. You see, Patrick Alexander was a spy. An unusual man. He inherited a fortune from his father, but he had a strange feeling that he would not live past the age of 50, so he gave all of his money to charitable causes and devoted his life to the Aeronautical Society of Great Britain. A prominent member of that society, Patrick was privy to the very latest information, including the military applications of aircraft. Now there was something in the wind, literally, in the wind which threatened Britain's national security as no weapon ever had. The remedy for this vulnerability, Patrick reasoned, was better to understand the threat. So Patrick Alexander volunteered to become a spy. He would travel to the foreign testing site. He would befriend the engineers working there. He would learn everything he possibly could about the research and development of Britain's potential nemesis, and once the mission itself was underway, Patrick was rather relieved. First of all, security was not as tight as he might have imagined. Access to the testing site was virtually unobstructed, and the engineers who were working on the project, they were friendly, unsuspecting. It's no trouble at all gathering information. In fact, and imagine this, Patrick Alexander, the British spy, was invited to witness the test flight of this revolutionary new aircraft, the potential new weapon. And the test flight was a success, but for some reason no record of why in historical records, for some inconceivable reason, Patrick did not show up for that test. We know he survived his adventure, eventually returned to Great Britain. Members of the British Armed Forces continued the investigation which Patrick had begun but by then the whole world knew what was going on in the United States, in Dayton, Ohio. You see, when Patrick Alexander first came to America, on his mission of espionage, the only aircraft viable for military use were balloons, essentially reconnaissance balloons. British military strategists were interested in dirigibles and gliders and even kites that lifted soldiers into the skies but they were especially interested in certain experiments taking place in the United States. The British were right to be concerned. The invention testing its wings in America would pose a serious threat to Britain's national security only four decades later. Indeed, with that innovation, the British Isles became vulnerable as never before. So the answer is yes. A full year before that first successful flight at Kitty Hawk, December 1903, the British had begun spying on the Wright brothers. Only now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. Patrick Young Alexander was born on March 28, 1867. His father, Andrew Alexander, was a civil engineer who was interested in aeronautics. In 1866, the year before Patrick was born, Andrew was a founding member of the Royal Aeronautical Society. In June 1875, Andrew visited the Crystal Palace, which was a cast iron and plate glass structure built in London to house the Great Exhibition of 1851. Andrew certainly saw many new technologies, but he was there for a specific purpose. He went to see Thomas Moy test his aerial steamer. Now, the aerial steamer was an unmanned tandem wing aircraft driven by a three horsepower steam engine. The steam engine powered a pair of six bladed propellers mounted to a bamboo frame. The aerial steamer's wings were also made of bamboo and covered with linen. Can you imagine flying in an airplane made of bamboo propelled by a steam engine? 
Now, of course, that's from someone with a 21st century perspective and by someone who's piloted airplanes. But in 1875, no one knew what type of engine would be best suited for airplanes. On that warm June day, Thomas Moy tested the aerial steamer while it was still tethered to the ground. This was done out of safety. Remember that Thomas Moy's aerial steamer had no pilot. The first attempt did little but churn up the gravel on the ground. In the second attempt, the aerial steamer reached a speed of about 12 miles per hour. But that was only about a third of the power Thomas Moy calculated was needed to generate enough lift to get it off the ground. The aerial steamer, it may have hopped, but it never flew. Throughout Patrick's young life, his father often discussed heavier-than-air flight and assured him that one day man would fly like the birds in the sky. Like his father, Patrick became interested in aviation. In 1878, Andrew took his family, which included his wife Emma, his oldest son John Edmund, and 11-year-old Patrick, to the Paris exhibition where they saw Félix du Templeau's 1874 monoplane, which was another steam-powered contraption that failed to fly. They also saw the completed head of the Statue of Liberty. But the highlight of their visit was Henri Giffard's enormous hydrogen balloon, which was capable of carrying 52 passengers to a maximum height of 1,600 feet. The balloon could certainly have gone much higher, but it was limited to the length of the rope that tethered the balloon to the ground, 1,600 feet. In 1885, Patrick joined the British Navy and served aboard a ship called the Monero. After 60 days aboard the ship, Patrick fell from one of the masts and broke his leg. The ship was three weeks away from port. Patrick's leg healed, well, somewhat healed, without proper medical attention. A couple of months after his accident, Patrick was walking on the ship's deck with a crutch. He was doing all he could to help, but he was limited. He slipped, fell, and rebroke his injured leg. Patrick limped for the rest of his life. In 1886, Patrick's older brother died. His mother died the following year. Three years later, 1890, Patrick's father died. By the young age of 23, Patrick had lost his whole family. He inherited his father's entire estate, which amounted to 60,000 pounds. Adjusted for inflation, that's over $12 million in today's money. Patrick's inheritance allowed him the freedom to follow his interests in aviation, meteorology, astronomy, parachutes, and balloons. In 1891, Patrick made his first gas balloon ascent. He eventually became a licensed balloonist. Patrick quickly realized for balloons to be useful, they had to be navigable. Balloonists at the time could only control the height of the balloon, and the balloons went wherever the wind blew them. Patrick tried to find a way to make balloons navigable. In 1893 and 1894, he filed several patents, including one for reciprocating oars, which would be affixed to balloon. Another included a type of fan to blow the balloon in the desired direction. He patented a way to use piped steam to heat the gas in balloons. Unfortunately, his patents, as they were drafted, were not practical, but Patrick never lost faith in balloons as a means of transportation. Patrick was a member of Aero Clubs, A-E-R-O Clubs, of Berlin, Paris, America, and Austria. In 1900, Patrick witnessed the launch of the first ever Zeppelin. The Zeppelin was launched from a floating raft on Lake Constance, situated where Germany, Switzerland, and Austria meet. Patrick hired a motorboat to take him as close as possible to the Zeppelin during the launch. Patrick was also interested in flying machines which were heavier than air. He traveled all over Europe and America to witness experiments firsthand. He wanted to be there when man made the first flight in a heavier than air craft. In December 1902, Patrick visited the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. Up to this point, none of the so-called aircrafts had successfully flown. 
In the following year, the Wright brothers learned that Patrick was planning another trip to the United States. Orville and Wilbur sent him a telegram inviting him to Kitty Hawk to see their newest design, the Wright Flyer. Somehow, Patrick received their message too late. Had Patrick received that message, he certainly would have been at Kitty Hawk on December 17, 1903 to witness the first sustained flight by a manned, heavier-than-air, powered and controlled aircraft. The Wright brothers flew the Wright Flyer four times that day. Can you imagine Patrick's disappointment? Mm. Mr. Harvey explained that Patrick Alexander was a spy for the British government. But was he really? Between 1885, the year in which he broke the same leg twice, and 1904, I could find no evidence that Patrick worked with the British military. In June 1904, six months after the Wright brothers flew the Wright Flyer, Patrick began working with the British military, but with the Army's balloon section. Mr. Harvey most likely got his information from this article, published in newspapers around the country on March 28, 1981. In the article, Professor Alfred Gollin of University of California at Santa Barbara said, The spy, Patrick Alexander, became so friendly with the Wright brothers, they invited him to Kitty Hawk to view what turned out to be the first successful flight in history of a motor-powered plane. Professor Gollin said, Alexander kept in touch with the Wright brothers and visited them several times in Dayton, New York, and France. For years after their successful flight, the Wright brothers tried to sell their airplanes to the British War Office, but the deals always fell through. Based on available resources, it appears that Patrick Alexander was not a spy for the British. Patrick was just someone who was genuinely interested in the advancements in aviation. Earlier, Mr. Harvey explained that Patrick inherited a fortune from his father but gave most of it to charity because he believed he would not live past the age of 50. Well, Patrick lived to be 76 years old. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And now you know the rest of the rest of the story.